more of this inward spiritual philosophy thing. So Peter comes down pretty hard in chapter 2 on the false teachers. He calls them out, calling them blots and blemishes, springs without water. They mouth empty and boastful words. They appeal to the flesh. They're greedy. And they entice people away from true freedom. And he goes on and defends the authority of the Old Testament, of the apostles. And then he promises that judgment will come for them. And he uses these tremendous examples. If God did not spare the angels, if God did not spare the earth during the time of Noah, if God did not spare Sodom and Gomorrah, will he not also bring judgment upon these false teachers? Like I said, heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. Today, Peter's going to take a turn in this letter. He's about to remind the recipients of this letter and us why he's writing to them and the promises of God that are to come. So if you have a Bible, we are going to be in 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, it should be on the screen otherwise. Start in verse 1. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Peter opens up this chapter with an interesting phrase, dear friends. It's so easy to read the previous chapter and all the fire and brimstone sections and just feel all this judgment and condemnation. But that's not Peter's objective here. He's not coming down on them. He's not demanding things from them. Instead, he's coming to them as a friend, pleading with them. And I want you to notice as we go through this chapter that phrase, dear friends, because it's incredibly important. It shows up four times in this chapter. And every time it shows up, Peter is trying to remind them of the promises of God in their lives. That it's better to follow the ways of Jesus instead of following the ways of of those false teachers. The first reminder that he has for them is that nothing that's occurring right now, nothing that's being taught, nothing that has ever occurred, especially to the church, is a surprise. Verse 2. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has been since the beginning of creation. None of this is catching Peter or God by surprise. Notice what he says here. In the last days, there will be scoffers scoffing and following their evil desires. Where is this coming that Jesus promised about? We hear the term last days, and it, it picks up all kinds of meaning uh, in today's society. What, what the Bible talks about the last days is anything after Pentecost is the last days. Congratulations. You live in the midst of the last days. The last uh, 1900 and almost 2,000 years, math, is the last days. It's the last days. It's this thing that, that, that Jesus will come during the last days and change everything and make all things new. Joel talks about it. In the last days, your sons will prophesy, your daughters will dream dreams, or vice versa. Your old man will dream dreams. You're in the last days. You're in the last days. And Peter was reminding them that it's been promised. In the days that we live in, in these last days, people will scoff at faith. Where is Jesus? Where is God? If God is real, why isn't He doing anything about it? Why isn't He keeping His promises? Ain't that sound familiar? You heard that one before? We hear those same arguments today that Peter heard in his day. There's a couple of writers that I like, Christian writers that I like, that, are, that publish in secular magazines and newspapers. 
Um, they write things about faith, and they can be extremely thought-provoking. People like Tish Harrison Warren. I don't know if you've ever read any of her stuff. She's an Anglican priest. She's a lot more evangelical than, than uh, Episcopalian. And she writes these incredible uh, things on, on, on faith, on the spiritual disciplines, on the rhythms of life. Worth reading, worth reading. Uh, she had a, a column for the longest time in the New York Times. There's a bunch of other Christians, by the way, that write in the New York Times. It's always fun to find them. And, and if you read their column, it's, it's very thought-provoking. It, it really convicts you at times. But what's more interesting, especially if, if you're wired a certain way, is to read the comments that people have about these columns. People are really mean. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but they're really mean especially people outside of the church, towards people in the church. The, the comments, I, I guarantee you what it is. There'll be something about um, the Catholic Church molesting children. There'll be something about sexual abuse. There'll be some, something about uh, how our taxes are being spent on the church. There'll be all kinds of stuff, and it'll all be really, really, really nasty. That doesn't surprise us, getting criticisms, getting complaints from outside of the church. What's really interesting is those, those same odd thoughts about who God is, who Jesus is, we find them inside of the church too. And that's where it kind of gets scary, because there's all kinds of teachings out there that can pull us away from Jesus. There's a teaching that I, I hear all the time from Christians they're positive it's somewhere in the Bible, probably in Proverbs. God loves those, or God takes care of those who take care of themselves. You ever hear that one? God takes care of those who take care of themselves. It's somewhere in there, I know it. Yeah, first imagination. It's, it's in there somewhere. That was Benjamin Franklin, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Not, not Scripture. There's all kinds of these things that pop up, and somehow they find their way into the church that have no, no being in the church. And so Peter's calling them, as well as us, to remember. He says in verse 2, recall the words spoken in the past by the prophets of the Old Testament, the commands given by Jesus. For we live in a time where we find ourselves surrounded by voices trying to show us different ways, different paths, different parts places to go. And the scary part is it doesn't take much for us to lose our way. A couple years ago, if you remember about a year ago, we had a, a flood. The bathroom upstairs in our house, or the toilet upstairs in our house overflowed. It was continually running and no one was home. And so it got into the duct work and then flooded out the ceiling and the basement below. And in the, we have a bedroom downstairs and it has a, a, a drop ceiling in with ceiling tiles. And so once we got it all cleaned out, I finally got to the place where I was going to put the ceiling tiles back in. And putting seals, ceiling tiles in is not that difficult as long as the, the, the grid's up. So I went, I bought some ceiling tiles, and I started to put them in to replace the ones that were damaged. And then I got to the, the weird part of the room where the ceiling tiles needed to be cut. Now, cutting a ceiling tile is really easy. You just need a, a sharp knife, to kind of score it a couple of times, uh, and then you break it off, and boom, you're done. It's really helpful if you have a straight edge to kind of cut against. Um, but I didn't. I only had a, a short straight edge. I didn't have a straight edge that would go all the way across. There was about another four or five inches at the end of the ceiling tile where I didn't have the edge, and I thought, how hard is it just to keep a straight line? So I went with my straight edge, and then as soon as the straight edge went, I just kind of kept on going, and I snapped the, the ceiling tile, and I went into the bedroom, and I went to go hang it, and lo and behold, I had two inches of a gap in one corner because I couldn't keep a straight line. When I took it down and looked at it, it looked straight, but when I put it in the ceiling, it wasn't straight. It doesn't take much for us to, to find ourselves kind of off course to find ourselves far away from where we thought we were supposed to be. Remember what was promised, P. 
Peter pleads, because a time of judgment is coming. Verse 5. But they deliberately forgot that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of the waters and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Peter commands them, remember, because just as God created everything, the end of everything is also coming. At some point, we will be brought to account. Not just us, but all of creation will be bought, brought to account. The promise of this occurs in Jesus' second coming. When He comes again, He will come to judge that's the expectation. But it's so easy just to ignore that. To forget about it. To think about, ah, it's been 2,000 years. It hasn't come in 2,000 years. I'm pretty sure we're good now. We don't have to worry about that. Peter says this in verse 8, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. There was an expectation in the early church that Jesus was going to come back soon. They expected it in most of the apostles' lifetime, especially during John's lifetime. That Jesus was going to come back. That he was going to bring in the end of the age. But it had been 30 years. Jesus hadn't come back yet. We opened 2 Peter by talking about that. 30 years doesn't seem like much, especially for some of us who've been around more than 30 years. 30 years is a long time. We talked about 30 years ago, right now. It was O.J. Simpson. Uh, Chase, that many of us of a certain age remember. 30 years goes by really quick. And, and in that 30 years, you tend to forget things. And that's easy for us. In, in the church, every few years, something pops up that Jesus is about to return. It happened in 1988, it happened several times during the 90s, it happened several times. It happened like two years ago. Jesus was going to come back. There isn't a lot of teachings during, during COVID. Jesus is going to come back any moment in COVID. But then something happens. The day Jesus is supposed to come back, he doesn't come back. He doesn't show up. And then somebody else will come up. Jesus is coming back. We get numb to it after a while, right? What's taking so long? Maybe he's not really coming back. Maybe this is all it's about, you know? Live a life, get to heaven, call it a day. But Peter opens up this section by quoting Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass in the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. It's an interesting picture in this psalm because God's perspective of time is very different than our perspective of time. We consider time in the context of our lifetime. Later on, the psalmist goes on and says, but our life is like 70 or 80 years. We look at that and we think that's a long period of time. But God is looking through things through the lens of eternity. Things look very different in that lens. 
And so Peter is saying, in, through the lens of eternity, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. No. It's not about slowness. It's about patience. It's God's mercy that Jesus has not returned yet. Because when he does, it'll mean the end of all things. Judgment will come. I, I think we get confused sometimes about judgment. We look at God and we think of him like this grumpy old man, nitpicking everything that we do wrong, keeping a list. It's like the evil Santa Claus, right? You know, good Santa Claus keeps the list so we get gifts. You know, God keeps the list so that... Yeah. That's not the picture Peter's painting here. He's picturing a different one. God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish. I'm going to say something that might shock some of you. It's not God's desire that we perish. It's His desire that all come to repentance. But just because it's His desire doesn't mean that it's going to happen. People ask me all the time, why do bad things happen to good people? Why, why did God allow Hitler to occur? Why did God allow these bad things to occur? If there's a God, couldn't he just fix it? Stop it? He could. He could. But then we run into this little problem about free will, right? I mean, you like making choices, don't you? You like the freedom to make a choice. You don't want to be a robot just doing what you're told. Those ability to make choices, that's what brings evil into the world because we're not really good at making choices. I mean, think about how the Bible starts, right? God creates Adam, creates Eve, puts them in this beautiful garden. They're walking with God in the quiet of day. It's a beautiful picture. All their needs are taken care of. Everything is there. And then God seems to want to take it to the next level with them. He gives them a choice. Walk with me in the cool of the day. Or there's this tree over there. Don't, don't, don't go there because that will lead to death. If you ever had a toddler and you want to motivate the toddler to do something, just say, don't, don't touch this. And then like immediately they're like, what? Touch? Touch? Where? And so like toddlers, Adam and Eve end up at the tree. They make a choice. We're not good at choices. But the ability to have that choice allows us to truly worship God. Because if we don't have a choice, then the worship we give is not true worship. The love we give is not true love. If you, if you are forced to love someone, that's not actually love. But when we love and worship someone out of our own choice, that is true worship. The choice has to be there. But the choice opens up the door for sin and for evil and for wickedness. God's given us a choice. Repent, accept Jesus, be forgiven and redeemed, or choose judgment. And though it's God's desire that we repent, for many, they will reject that gift. They will choose judgment instead. But no, the day is coming. Verse 10 of 2 Peter 3, if I can get back there. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt by heat. But in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Let me ask you this. What's the hope of our faith? What's the hope of our faith? For many, it's about escaping, getting out of here, getting to heaven, and being with God. That's the hope that they think. But that's not the hope of the Bible, especially the New Testament. 
The hope of our faith right here is in verse 13. A new heaven, a new earth, that God is going to come and set all things right. That He's going to set creation right. What is broken, He is going to set right. And we see that in the book of Revelations. Verse, uh, chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a beautiful, or as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed. He who was sitting on the throne said, I am making everything new. Our hope is not that we get to go to heaven and hang with God one day. Our hope is that God is going to come down and dwell with us. It's not that we go, it's that He comes. And that should give us some perspective. Because Peter is calling us to live this godly lives, to speed the day of the Lord's coming. So how do we exactly speed it? What does it mean to live a godly life? Well, I think our, it means our lives should be lived as Jesus did. Following His ways. Being transformed by Him. And doing His mission. What was his mission? His mission was calling the lost to be reconciled to God. Calling people to repentance. One of the interesting pictures is Jesus' description of the end times. And that's in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Jesus says this, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So if you want Jesus to come back sooner, do you know what you're supposed to do? Preach the gospel to all nations. I had a guy come to me this summer and explain to me, based on all of this number stuff in the Bible and prophecies, and this guy here and this guy here, how Jesus was about to come back at any moment, because the wickedness of the world has gotten to a certain level and blah, blah, blah. blah. And I said, yeah, no. He's not. He goes, why not? I go, Matthew 24. He goes, what do you mean Matthew 24? Matthew 24. I go, and this gospel has to be preached to all nations. Revelation tells every tribe, every tongue, every people. You know, there's still about 1,100 people groups that have not heard the gospel. And the scary part is that number is starting to grow, not shrink. Because you forget, you preach to one generation, but then another generation shows up. There's still a lot of the world that has not heard the gospel. I've, I've mentioned this before. The Chinese church has this idea that the gospel is heading west that it started in Jerusalem, went up to Europe, came over into the Americas, and then swung around the Pacific and ended up in the East, in China. And they believe that their job is to bring back the old spice roads and take the gospel, instead of spices to Europe, take the gospel into the Middle East. That, that brings tingles. Not only should we be seeing the gospel preached, but our lives should also look a bit different. Verse 14. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Peter calls the false teachers blots and blemishes chapter 2. Here he's calling us to be different. Instead of being blots and blemishes, we should be spotless and blameless. We should be at peace with Jesus. 
How do we get to be at peace? Well, we become at peace with Jesus when we become one of His disciples. When we are following His ways. When we are being transformed by Him. When we are aligning our lives with Jesus' mission. And I think that's the challenge that Peter is presenting to us. It's a simple question. Who is your life aligned with? Or better yet, who are your allegiances to? Are they to Jesus? Or are they to something else? Peter wraps this letter up with one final warning and a blessing. Verse 15. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard, so that you may not be carried away by the air of the, of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forevermore. Amen. I love how Peter brings Paul into this. You see, Paul agrees with me, guys. But then there's this warning. Just as as people have distorted the Old Testament, they're also going to distort Paul and Paul's teaching. See, what people don't fully understand, they distort. So dear friends, be on guard. Don't be pulled away from Jesus by these false teachers, but instead grow in both grace and knowledge of Him. Amen. We started this journey in the epistles of Peter back on Memorial Day. And it's quite fitting that we wrap it up on Labor Day. I mentioned back then that I felt these two letters were extremely relevant for us today. Because we live in a time when our society is greatly polarized. We struggle to find middle ground with people. Instead, we tend to vilify those who disagree with us, even in our families. I mean, the holidays are coming. Many of us aren't looking forward to those. Much of this is stoked by the false prophets of our day. I don't know if you've noticed this, but everything's on fire today. Everything is going wrong. Everyone then becomes your enemy, and there's no hope unless we vilify those who look different than us, those who think different from us, those who act different from us. We need to remove them. That's a promise that those teachers are trying to convince us that the way to salvation, the way to hope, the way to the promised land can only be found through their ideas, aligning with them. But but as we chase after these mirages of hope, we discover that they're exactly what Peter described. Springs without water. They appear like they'll give life, but instead they only lead to death. And then we find ourselves being disappointed, disillusioned, and somewhat disgusted. But Jesus has promised us something better. Not a mirage, but hope. Real hope. Springs of living water. And the challenge for us is the same challenge that the church dealt with 2,000 years ago. Dear friends, He is not slow in keeping His promises as some understand slowness to be. There will be, and there are today, voices all around us demanding our attention, demanding our allegiance. But as a follower of Jesus, your attention and your allegiance belong solely to Him. Solely to Jesus. Remember, His slowness is about patience. Because His desire is that everyone comes to Him. His desire is that everyone comes. They are His beloved. Even those who don't look, speak, 
or act like us. They are still the Lord's beloved and they should be our beloved as well. Our hearts should be for the lost, just like Jesus' is. Not wishing anyone to perish, but that all come to a saving knowledge of Him. And so, dear friends, we are not called to hate our enemies. We're called to bless our enemies. Dear friends, we're not called to speak curses on them. We are called to pray for them. This is the way of Jesus. This is the way of faith and life. And this is supposed to be the way of the church. And so as we move into this fall, a fall that has an election in its midst, a fall that promises to be contentious, we need to remember some things. We will not find our hope in either Donald Trump or Camilla Harris. Our hope is not in whomever controls the White House or Congress. And we will never find hope in any political party or ideology. Instead, our hope is solely in Jesus. So I have a challenge for you. Over the next three months, instead of figuring out a way to decimate the libs or take out MAGA, ask this. What would it look like to be Jesus to them? To show them the love of Jesus. To show mercy and grace. To bring reconciliation. You see, that will change the world. Polarization does little other than to bring division and hate but Jesus has called us to reconcile and to show love. We should try that. It might actually work. So therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secured positions. But instead, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just invite Your presence to come right now with us. Lord, this has been a journey over the last several weeks, a few months. But Lord, I, I thank You for You have spoken to us through Peter. You've reminded us that, that the difficulties that we go through, that we think we are going through, they're, they're nothing in comparison to the promise and love and grace that You give us. And so Lord, I pray, as we move into the fall, as we move into a season that is promising to be complicated, as we see people around us grow in division, grow in hate. Lord, allow us to grow in love. Allow us to keep our eyes on You, Jesus. Allow us to remember that You are our hope. That our salvation comes through You. And that the promises that we hold on to are not promises of a better economy or a better place to live, but Lord, the promises are that one day you will come and dwell with us and you will make all things new. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We cry out with the church through the ages, come, Lord Jesus. Come into this place, come into our time, come into our city, into our community, come into our lives. 
We welcome you. We normally don't do a hard end. We kind of do a soft end as we move into ministry time. And so I want to invite um, John, and I think Cecilia's coming with her, and, and Jeff, if you guys would be willing to come up here and pray for people. The Lord has put a couple things that I think are on my heart that he wants to do today. First and foremost, um, we've talked a lot about being reconciled with God. We've talked a lot about accepting that reconciliation or accepting judgment or what have you. I'm not trying to like be fire and brimstone now. I just want to bring an offering. Jesus is here. Jesus wants to be in your life. Jesus wants to bring life and life everlasting. So I just want to invite you, if you've not given your life to Jesus, if you've not invited him in, if you've not accepted God's gift of forgiveness and reconciliation, today is a wonderful day to do it. We all have a choice. God gives us a choice. And so I'm going to pray a little prayer. And I want to invite you, if you've not accepted uh, Jesus, then just feel free to join in with me. Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life. Lord, I thank you for your sacrifice, for your death, your resurrection, and your forgiveness. Lord, forgive me for trying to do things on my own. Lord, come. Help me begin to follow you. I accept your gift of forgiveness. Come and reconcile me to the Father. If you've prayed that 